So this video is going to be part two of Copying the Princess de Brulee by Dominique Gang. All of the preliminary stuff and information is in the first part of this video, which I'll have linked down below. So let's get started on this. In last week's video, we left off right here working on the necklace and working on this pendant, which is called a cross patty. For the entirety of this necklace, I'm only using one color, which is burnt umber. Now the burnt umber I'm using, of course, is a transparent color. And I really like uh, Createx Illustration's version of it because it's a very forgiving color. It takes a lot of layers to really get down a very dark value. So the great thing about it is I don't have to worry about going too dark because I really have to spray it on there to get the dark values. If you can't get the value dark enough just using the burnt umber, you could add some sepia at the end. But for this one, I only stuck with that one color. Now, like I said in the first part of this video, the key to getting anything to look metallic is very high contrast between darks and lights which are very close to each other it's kind of the opposite of painting a flesh tone or a portrait because there the skin has very smooth transitions between different values but when something's metallic you're always going to have a very bright highlight next to a very dark shadow take a look right here above this necklace on the, the part that's connecting it to the chain you can see I have this very bright highlight here and then right next to it we have that darker shadow and there's no real transition between those values it's basically a sharp line between bright and dark. I know with a lot of new painters this can be confusing because they'll think oh if I want to paint something gold I need a gold metallic color and that's not the case at all. The color is secondary. The trick is creating that illusion of very brights right next to very darks. So right now I'm using my eraser to pull out that very sharp highlight. You can see I'm erasing around the outline or the contour of this cross patty and since the key to painting a metallic surface is having those sharp contrasts I want to make sure that I don't come in and blend these you know by using an airbrush and spraying over it to smooth it out I want to make sure that I keep these transitions very sharp so you'll see for most of this I'm using my shield to paint in very sharp deep shadows and then switching to the eraser to pull out sharp thin highlights and for the rest of this cross there's no secrets or tricks that I'm using the only thing that I'm doing is I'm constantly looking back at my reference and trying to see where those shadows are and where the highlights are and then just doing the best I can to place them in where I see them. When a portrait is this complicated and there's just so much stuff going on, you don't have to worry about trying to get every single part absolutely perfect like this cross here. As long as you get it relatively close to what you're seeing, 95% of the viewers won't notice any little mistakes on this. And we'll see later on as we're painting the gown that I think Ang implemented some of this in his paintings as well. I've seen this painting thousands of times in text and probably at least a hundred times in real life. And there's just so many things that I didn't know until I actually copied this. So we'll talk about that as we get further along in the painting. The last thing I want to do for this cross is add in some very bright specular highlights. Now, of course, we know that Ang was using oil paint. So the way he would do this is add in a thick opaque paint, usually a white, maybe mixed with an orange or a yellow, and just kind of blot it on top. That way the paint is not only opaque and it's covering the layers underneath, but it's also sticking out a little bit. So it's catching more light and looking a little bit more reflective than the normal surface of the paint. And this technique goes back hundreds of years before Ang painted. But here we're using the opposite technique. What we want to do is we want to pull out as much paint as possible to show that white canvas underneath. The tool I'm using for this is a Dremel with an electric sand eraser, which is extremely aggressive. So when I just press this in some areas on this necklace or on this chain, it's going to pull out pure bright white highlights. And for this part, since it's metallic, I'm going to leave them as is. I'm not going to glaze a color over them to knock the value back down. We want these to be extremely bright. So even though these techniques are extremely different, the end result can look similar in both because we're really creating the same illusion. We're just putting darks where they need to be and lights where they need to be. It's really all about where those values are. From here, we're going to work on the most important part of the portrait, which is the gown. I really find it incredible the way that Ang is able to paint fabrics and drapery. We'll see as we get further along that he adds so much contrast to the gown, especially toward the, the lower section of it, that it almost looks like a metallic surface where he has very bright highlights next to dark, deep shadows. But before we get to that, we're going to have to start with this lace and work our way down. When you're painting something that's complicated, the best way to approach it is to break it down into small parts. Now I knew this painting was going to be complicated before I started painting it, but I realized how much work it was going to be once I actually started putting in the contour lines and the grids. There's just so much detail in here that it gets overwhelming if you try to do all of it in one shot. So the best way to approach it always is to work on one small section of it and work on that for a shorter amount of time, maybe a half hour, 
45 minutes. Learning to slow down is one of the best skills you can learn in painting. So make sure when you're working on something difficult like this one that you take plenty of time. So starting with the lace here just above the gown, I'm using my eraser and just erasing right into that flesh tone. I'm basically using this eraser like a paintbrush with some opaque paint on it. Again, the style we're using is a negative technique, meaning that our highlights are achieved by erasing into the paint. Let's put up a cropped version of Ang's final painting up on the left side of the screen so that we can compare the two. We can see on Ang's that he has very sharp lines between this gown and the background or this gown and the flesh tone. So in order to do that, I'm using some frisket film. This frisket film is transparent, so I could see my line drawings underneath. So I basically just place it on the canvas and then cut into it. The color that I'm using for the dress is cerulean blue. This color is a highly saturated blue, but it has just a hint of a green in it. So it's almost like a blue teal color. As I mentioned in the first part of this video, I'm not trying to match every color absolutely perfectly. I'm just getting close. The, the main goal here is to focus on the values. And this cerulean blue is gonna work just fine for the mid-tones and the highlights. We'll use some cobalt blue and some black for the shadows later on. If we look at the original painting, we can see that the light source is over to the left. So this obviously means that highlights are gonna be on the left side and the corresponding shadows are gonna be off to the right. This gown has a lot of decoration to it. You can see the top part kinda has this crinkled look to it. I don't know anything about fashion, so I don't know what this is called. But basically it's a wavy pattern where parts are raised toward the viewer and then other parts are sunk in farther away. So as we work on this top section here, we have to have that pattern in of highlight shadow highlight shadow and the best way to go about that is to apply some paint first kind of set your mid-tone and then erase into it to pull out the highlight and then add some more paint for the shadow this way we're going to simplify it by using one color and we're going to achieve our values just by how much paint is applied to the canvas this part can be very difficult with an airbrush if you don't control your overspray we don't want any of that blue paint getting on to the flesh tone because a flesh tone is always kind of a desaturated orange color and blue is a complementary color to orange. So if any of that blue gets onto the flesh tone, it's gonna to start graying it out very quickly. So I have to be extra careful here not to allow any of that overspray from this blue paint to get onto that flesh tone. So you'll see that I switch off between Frisket and then some 3M vinyl tape with some uh, painter's tape over the top of it, just to kind of create a dam so overspray doesn't get farther than I want it to. So to paint in those sharp lines between the shadows and the highlights, you can see that I'm using a ripped piece of paper. I really like using a piece of paper just because you can rip it to any size you like and it gives you a nice natural looking edge. I try to direct my spray from right to left and I'm always spraying on the paper, letting the overspray kind of spill onto the canvas. When using any sort of shield, including a ripped piece of paper, you can control how sharp that line is by how much paint you spray. So my favorite way to add a small amount of paint is to use that overspray to your advantage. So always try to spray on the shield rather than spraying on the canvas. Remember that you could always go darker and add more paint if you need to. Let's take a look at Ang's painting on the left side of the screen. There's a bunch of ways that he could have painted this, but it's most likely that he started with a mid-tone or a base tone of blue just to kind of set the value at a certain point and then came in with brighter highlights in opaque colors and then darker values. It's clear that the paint was still wet as he added his highlights in because they're blended. But even though Ang absolutely hated brush strokes in his work, you could see on these highlights that there's a good amount of brush strokes in his painting. It's like I said in the first part of this video, if you're painting with a paintbrush, there's always gonna be some brush strokes. It doesn't matter how much you actually blend it. Just like when using an airbrush, you're always gonna see some type of overspray and some soft lines. Remember that every medium or tool you use to paint with is always gonna have its pros and cons. So it's up to any artist or new painter to kind of weigh the options and decide what you like to use the most because oil paint is a great medium to work with but you know it has some limitations and the same thing goes for airbrush and acrylic paint so even though i'm using an airbrush i still want to try to emulate what i see in ang's paintings i definitely see some brush strokes in those highlights where he used opaque paint so the way i go about doing that is using my eraser trying to pull out these highlights very bright and trying not to hide the marks left from the eraser, kind of those scratchy marks that you naturally get. It's not an exact copy of what you'd get with a brush and opaque paint, but you can get it pretty close. I'm gonna have to speed through a good amount of this to keep the time down. But as you can see for this next part, I just followed that same procedure. Working from left to right, I added some value in, which was my base tone, erased into it for the highlights, and then added some more paint for the shadows. Now let's move along to the sleeve where we have something interesting going on. 
Not only do we have the blue gown in the background with its own shadows and highlights, but we also have this very thin transparent lace over the top of it with a very intricate design on it. If you're a new painter, this could seem very daunting and nearly impossible, but we're gonna have to break it down into small parts and work on it piece by piece. The most important thing, like always, is we have to focus on the values. Where do we see lights and where do we see darks? I decided to start with the background here and then work my way forward. So the first thing I notice in the background here is that crease that goes across the length of the sleeve. It's basically a fold in the fabric, which is casting a shadow. So I'm just using a large shield here that I have and lightly spraying over it to define that line. That shadow is pretty dark compared to the areas surrounding it, so I just want to start light like always just to kind of understand where I am and understand the placement of it. Just like painting the face, I'm always starting with the lightest values possible by spraying a small amount of paint. And once I feel confident that they're correct, I'll just add more paint to it. The way that I'm going to go about adding in that decorative pattern on the lace is by using a negative technique and erasing into paint. In order to do that, the first thing I need to do is lay down some paint. That way we have something to erase into. So I'm starting on the right side of the sleeve, kind of where this dark shadow is right here. So while I'm looking at the reference painting from Ang, I'm trying to block out all those decorative patterns that are in the front. I'm trying to just look at the dark shadows of the dress or the gown underneath. I'm just trying to see where I see shadows and where I see highlights. And then I'm just trying to add the paint in there. This may seem complicated, but actually it's pretty forgiving because all those layers, those shadows of blue are going to be covered up by this pattern. So most of this paint that I'm putting down in the background is actually going to be erased away. And one of the reasons I love transparent paint so much is that I still get to see my drawing underneath. As you can see here, I'm just following my line drawing, my contour drawing underneath and erasing out this pattern. I find this so, so helpful in my painting because I just always kind of have something to help me out to kind of show me where I'm going to go. When you're painting something intricate and complicated like this pattern, it's it's really easy to get lost and I do it all the time and that line drawing underneath just offers me that little bit of reassurance to understand that I'm in the place that I'm supposed to be and I'm getting in the values that I want. In Ang's original painting it's most likely that he painted the shoulder in first just in those blue colors and then once it dried it came in with those opaque colors and just laid them in on top to paint in this pattern. To make it easier on myself, I'm not going to paint in the whole shoulder in blue first. I want to make sure that I work on one section and add in the details that I need before moving on to the next. So at this point, as I have some of that pattern laid in there, I notice that that background is still too light, but that's good. That's what I want in an airbrush painting. So I'm switching back to my airbrush and adding in some more paint. But unfortunately, when I do that, I'm going to get a lot of overspray and a lot of paint is going to cover up that area that I just erased out. So of course, I switch back to my my eraser and then erase that pattern back out. There's so many ways to go about painting this. You could even just let the airbrush paint dry and then come over it with opaque white. But for me, I found this to be the most forgiving way, even though it's a lot slower. Each time I add a new layer of paint or a glaze over the top of this pattern, I basically get a fresh start to erase into it again so I could kind of adjust it each time. For me personally, I'd rather take any technique that's slower and gives me more control and something that's quicker but is riskier. And like I've said plenty of times before, there's no right way to paint, so don't think that the way I'm doing this is the correct way. It's just the way that's easiest for me. Now, I'm going to speed through this so I don't bore you guys to death, but I'm just constantly doing that same process of adding paint, removing it, and adding it again. As I'm moving along to the left, I start first by adding in some of those darker shadows in the background. That way, there's some paint down, and then I can start erasing into it to add that pattern in. One thing you'll notice while I'm working on this is that I'm not pushing my values to the extremes. The darks aren't as dark as they need to be for the final painting, and the lights aren't light enough yet. That's a good thing for me because as I continue along on the dress and eventually finish it, I could stand back and look at my painting compared to Ang's original painting and see what I need to adjust. I'll usually come back in then with my eraser, you know, only using an eraser, and then pull out highlights much brighter by using more pressure. I like to think of values in any painting as micro values and macro values. The micro values are all these small ones, all these little highlights and these small shadows together. But as you move away from your painting, you start to see the large masses of light and shadow. 
And for me, I consider those the macro values. If you're getting confused or you don't understand what I'm talking about, let me show you an example. Up here where we have this scrunchy pattern, I'd consider all these little bright spots to be micro values. And since these are the highlights, these are the micro highlights. And the darker areas right next to them are the micro shadows. But now as we zoom out and look at the completed painting the way a viewer would see it, we start to notice the macro values. These are basically large masses of light and shadow. On the left shoulder here where the light's hitting, this is a macro highlight. And if we look below our hands, we'll see that darker shadow, which I'd consider to be a macro shadow. But as you can see within that macro shadow are a bunch of micro highlights and micro shadows. I really hope that this isn't confusing, but for me, it's kind of the way that I think about it when I'm looking at a painting. When I'm working up close, I'm mainly thinking about the micro highlights and shadows. And then I always stop and stand back to look at it from a distance to think about those macro values. And if those values are too light, you're always gonna be in a good place because it's so easy with an airbrush to darken them back up and glaze another layer over the top. So I'm gonna wrap up this video here and we'll continue along with this painting next week. If you're working on copying this one yourself, feel free to ask any questions down below. I'll be happy to help you out. And also for a very good reference photo of this, make sure you go to the Mets website and look at Ang's paintings. You'll find a, a bunch of photos of this one in different values and different contrasts. And it's just a great resource to kind of understand a little bit of the history of Ang and of this painting. So just to recap what I said before, the values on the lace right now are not what they're gonna be on the final painting. After I complete this whole painting, I'm gonna come back and pull out these highlights so that they're brighter. And I'll probably also add some more shadows just so we have some more contrast between those darks and those lights. It's always kind of a balancing act to get the micro and the macro values accurate. Just take your time while painting and practice observing what you see. I hope this one was helpful. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you next week.